let's get started. We hope you enjoy today's webinar, Importance of Standard Operating Procedures, presented by Sue Ellen Bethman. Sue Ellen started at Taconic in 1999 in our monoclonal antibody production group and also worked in contract research solutions. She is currently the manager of Taconic's isolator breeding solutions in Albany, New York. Sue Ellen holds a bachelor's degree in biology. Her qualifications include a Six Sigma Green Belt from the American Society for Quality, and she is an ALAS certified technologist. In addition, she is a 2009 graduate of Taconic's management development program. This webinar will introduce concepts for creating clear, concise, and consistent standard operating procedures, the importance of controlling documents, and keeping them up to date will be discussed, and examples from current Taconic SOPs will be shown. And with this, I will hand over the word to Sue Ellen Dittmann. Please, Sue Ellen. Hello, thank you, Margaret, and thank you, everybody, for taking the time today to attend this webinar. Today, I will be discussing with you some tips and tricks to keep in mind when you're writing standard operating procedures, which at times can seem like a daunting task. I really hope to break it down for you and provide uh, some useful information to assist you in both writing standard operating procedures and when it comes time to review and revise them. First, what is a standard operating procedure? Standard Operating Procedure, or SOP, is really a set of instructions that should address the who, the what, the where, the how, the when of an activity, and they may also address the why. But really, the primary purpose is to guide your activity and standardize it, and also to aid in producing and gathering reliable data. The reason I say it may address the why is because sometimes the why of a document can be lengthy and complex and might better be captured in a training document rather than having a long explanation at the beginning of a document as to why the document is there. SOPs should detail any regularly recurring work as they help ensure the process is completed correctly, that it's completed completely, and that any variability is minimized, and they also assist in promoting quality across the organization. Most facilities have a variety of staff that will be performing the same tasks, whether that be because you have different shifts of work or a weekday versus weekend staff, or maybe you have temporary staff to come in and cover holidays or sick time. SOPs really help provide assurance that that work is completed consistently. They're also a great learning tool for new staff. They help provide continuity when you have turnover, and they help keep all employees aware of their roles and responsibilities per procedure. SOPs can also be a powerful management tool, as having SOPs help make some of those day-to-day -day decisions for you. And if your procedure is laid out in a step-by-step -step fashion and a question comes up, you have a document to go to and reference and help aid you in making decisions when things do come up. When would you want to write an SOP? Well, there are a variety of cases where SOPs would be called for, but common topics would include animal care tasks, such as how and when cages will be cleaned, housing densities that may vary per species, or if you have breeding animals versus animals in holding, when animal observations need to occur, when these need to happen, what will be looked at specifically, what will be documented, who things need to be reported to. Common procedures such as animal identification, routine blood or tissue collection, if you are routinely collecting tissues, say tail samples or ear samples for genotyping, it's a good idea to have a procedure listed out as to when and how those tissues will be collected and submitted for genotyping. Any common lab assays, perhaps you do standard quality control procedures or sterility checks that you would want laid out. Data collection is a great topic to have SOPs around. How things will be documented, what will be documented, who needs to see and review the documentation, how errors will be handled if there's misspelling or crossouts, how will that be captured, how will data be stored, where will documents be held, 
who will have access to them, how long will documents be kept for, and also surrounding equipment, how equipment will be used, maintained, and calibrated. Usually equipment comes with a manual. You may purchase a piece of equipment and the manual details 10 or 11 things the piece of equipment can do. Maybe your lab or facility is only using a few of those things. It's a good idea to have an SOP detailing specifically what you will use that equipment for. You might also consider having SOPs to dictate material or people, people flow if you have areas with different health profiles or statuses. I do want to point out that depending on what type of facility you work at, you likely fall under several different regulations, and those regulations should be reviewed as they may dictate when and what needs to be captured within an SOP. But a good rule of thumb to ask yourself when you're deciding if you need an SOP is, does this procedure occur repeatedly? Does it require decisions? Does it have decisions points in it? And could those decisions have a negative impact on the result? And if the answers to those questions are yes, then it's a good idea to go ahead and write an SOP. Really, SOPs are vital to ensure that your processes are completed in the same way and over time. And when you're writing a document, there's five C's to keep in mind, and those are clear and concise, complete, consistent, controlled, and current. And what I'd like to do now is to look at elite at each of these in a little bit of more detail. First, clear and concise. You want your SOPs to be written in plain language. A good rule of thumb is that somebody with a limited amount of experience and just a basic understanding of the procedure should be able to pick up this document and successfully reproduce it. And a good way to make sure that you have plain language is after you've written the document, have somebody maybe in another department or another area that's not running this procedure on a day-to-day -day basis, read over it and provide feedback if they feel it's clear enough that they could pick up, come into your area, and run the procedure successfully. If you have a lot of highly technical jargon, you should really try to avoid it. Or if you can't avoid it, clearly define it. And if the document will contain a lot of highly technical words, you might consider having a definition section at the beginning of the document. Along the same lines, abbreviations or acronyms for words should be avoided uh, and written out instead, or at least explained in the document. So for example, if you were repeatedly going to use the word standard operating procedure, at the beginning of the document, you could have a statement saying, standard operating procedure, hereto after referred to as SOP, so people at least have that reference to go back and understand what it means. Each step should be explained thoroughly, but as concisely as possible. When you're writing your procedure, you want to avoid using long sentences or paragraphs to explain tasks, and instead write steps in short descriptive sentences, preferably starting with action words such as pick up this pipette, record this temperature, things like that. Whenever possible, the use of pictures or diagrams is a great visual illustration. And some procedures can be documented through the use of flow charts or swim lanes, and that's a great visual tool and really clearly lays out for people how steps flow into one another. It's very important to not use any vague wording. And as an example, let's take a look at these next two sentences. The first, after calibrating the thermometer, it should be labeled with the next calibration date. And the second, after calibrating the thermometer, it must be labeled with the cal next calibration date. So the word should could leave some room for interpretation. And maybe somebody picking up this document is going to say, do I have to label it? I'm not really sure. The word must removes that question. You don't want your SOP to raise questions. It's there to help answer questions. So if there's a requirement, it should be stated explicitly. SOPs are not meant to take the place of training, but they are a great training tool, both for new staff who will usually need to reference these SOPs each time they perform a procedure, and for people who are doing the training as they have a checklist when they're observing people to make sure they're hitting all the steps in the procedure. It's a good idea to have a training document as to what specifically the person has gone through to be trained on the SOP. And that may be attached to each procedure, or you might have a separate document that's a template that can be filled in per procedure. 
Again, you want to write your procedures such that somebody with just basic familiarity could successfully pick up this document and run the procedure. You might consider having a checklist or a set of work instructions if you have a very complex procedure, maybe a flowchart or swim lane that staff can have with them each time they perform the procedure. The nice thing about a checklist is it lends itself to data collection, and this again could be an attachment to the SOP or the document. This is an example from a current Taconic SOP about reprocessing isolators that I thought illustrated the use of wording that somebody with only a basic understanding uh, would be able to understand. So it's saying, check the entire outside of the isolator to include all connection ports and adapters for damage. So this person needs to understand what's an isolator, what's the connection port, and what's the adapter. And then the action, report damage to production support supervisor. And then below, it's telling us to look over the seams, and it specifically lists out we're looking for signs of leakage, including air, light, or moisture, or the buildup of residue. So it very clearly lays out the things to look for, and then the action, again, report any damage to the production support supervisor. Completeness. It's very important to ensure that all the steps are accounted for within the process. You want to write out your procedure in chronological order with clear beginning and end points. And if the procedure you're working on is followed by another procedure, you might end it by referencing that follow-up procedure. When you're writing your document, it's a good idea to write it down. Don't worry at first about grammar and punctuation. Then step away from it for a few hours or a day and come back to it and really look over it with a fine-tooth comb and make sure you've captured everything. Where possible, you want to try to think what could commonly go wrong with this procedure and let's put in some troubleshooting advice and when and who to notify. Perhaps there's a tolerance or range that's acceptable for your procedure. It's great to include that in your document. For example, you might have a pass-fail test that has a high fail rate. Is a technician permitted to try to rerun the assay before they notify supervision, or does supervision need to be notified with every failure? Tips like that are great to include in the SOP, so when the technician or the person comes to that decision point, they have guidance as to where to go. It can be helpful to reference other SOPs or documents as opposed to restating entire sections of other documents. Some things that are commonly referenced would be the equipment manual, material safety data sheets, personal protective requirements. A good example of this, if you are writing a procedure and you need to make sure that the pipette you're using is calibrated, rather than restating your entire calibration procedure, you could just have a statement in your document saying, ensure pipette is calibrated per document XYZ, and reference that document so people know where to go to make sure that their pipette is calibrated for the procedure. This is another example of a Taconic SOP where we have listed out references. So we have referenced safety and handling, telling the person to go look at document SE 1202 for the personal protective requirements, and also a document about preparing the approved sterilant for the procedure. And then a little further on in this document where we list out our reagents in preparation, again, we're referencing document SE 1207 for an approved sterilant as opposed to listing that out again. Before sitting down to write a new SOP, it's a great idea to look over other current SOPs. Perhaps SOPs could be combined or consolidating if you have similar procedures by simply adding a section to detail what's different about your procedure as opposed to creating a new document. For example, an SOP with a title of Procedure for Laboratory Rodent Identification could contain sections for several different ID methods as well as direction for when to use each as opposed to having one SOP for ear punch, one SOP for ear tag, etc. Consistency. The format, the font, and the tone should be the same from SOP to SOP. It's a great idea to have a template SOP that people can come and start from every time they're writing a new document. So things like the margins, the font size, when things are bolded is laid out for them. It's important that your layout and your flow are the same from document to document. Every SOP should have the same sections and in the same order. 
Some common sections that we see in SOPs would be the purpose, which would describe what the document is about and maybe a brief statement as to why. A reference section that can include any documents that are referenced within the SOP, regulations that might need to be referred to, equipment manuals, safety guidelines. A materials section that lists out the equipment and reagents necessary for that procedure. It's a good idea to have your materials section near the beginning so staff can see what they need ahead of time. It is vital to make sure that this section is complete. A good tip would be after you write out your procedure, go through it with a highlighter or a pencil and underline every piece of material or equipment that's referenced and then go back to that materials list and make sure you have accounted for everything that's necessary to complete the procedure. The procedure itself in step-by-step -step format, again, it could be listed out by bullet point, by number, by Roman numeral, as long as it's consistent and then any forms or documentation required for the procedure. Other sections you might consider would be a section for quality control or quality assurance requirements, a definition section if you're going to be having a lot of technical terms or acronyms and abbreviations, and any safety considerations for the document. This is an example of the format of current Taconic SOPs. Section 1 would be any quality assurance requirements. Section 2 is always the description and references where we discuss the purpose of the document, followed by references to other SOPs, any equipment manuals, any documents, any websites you might need to refer to commonly to complete the procedure. You want your level of detail across the documents to also be similar as your writing steps. It needs to be specific enough such that people can reproduce the procedure. Um, and if you have any sections in your SOP that aren't needed for a particular SOP, you could just put NA in the section as opposed to eliminating it. That's a good idea because as people get used to the flow and layout of your procedures, if a section that they're used to seeing isn't there, they might question if it was overlooked accidentally or if it's really not needed. You might also consider a limit to the number of steps allowed per page of your document and the number of pages per procedure, which can speak to keeping things clear and concise. Control. It's very important to keep control of your documents. Ideally, a person should have ownership of a document, or it could be a small group of people. And these people should have the authority to request revisions and to make changes to the document. When you do have revisions or updates to documents, it's important that they are routed both through the owner of the document, but also any relevant stakeholders, perhaps the vet, the IACUC, a safety committee. And also it's important to route it through any other groups that are using the document so they are, one, aware that a revision is being proposed, and two, have an opportunity to provide any feedback. It's also important to gather feedback from the end users of the document. This helps with a few things. One, it helps with buy-in as people are more likely to feel a part of a document that they've helped to create. And it helps to get a different perspective on the procedure. The owner of the document may not be the person that's in the lab running this procedure on a day-to-day -day basis. And the person who is in the lab might have some insight as to a process improvement that should be implemented or an idea of how to make things better or faster. After you do have a new revision, you need to take steps to ensure that any old versions are removed from all areas and that only the most recent version is available. It's important to have a defined system for cataloging your SOPs. SOPs should be numbered and titled consistently. It's a really good idea to have a numbering system as this would be easily searchable in a database. You want each SOP to have a unique identifier above and beyond the title. An example of a format could be a few letter code for a department followed by a, a number. Your documents should all be readily available in the workspace and electronic systems are really uh, a great way to handle this. 
if you have a computer in every lab, the employees have easy access to pull up a document whenever they need it. And there are systems that can help you track both the current and archived versions of your documents. They could hold all the archived documents so you can go back and look at changes that have been made and see when and why those changes were put in place. It can hold a list of all the approved owners of the document and also a list of who's using it, who has the ability to request revisions, who can approve revisions, and so on. Every document, whether it be the paper copy or an electronic copy, should have both the approved date and the expiration date on the document. If you do allow paper copies of documents, you might consider having a shorter expiration date on the paper copy to help ensure that employees are always using the most current version of the document. Current. After you write your SOPs and put them out and train on them, it is important to go back and revisit them on a regular basis. A good lean tool for that is a concept called PDCA, or Plan, Do, Check, Act. Uh, you want to pull out your documents on a, on a regular basis and look them over and make sure that you're still following the best practice. Perhaps over time there's been some drift in the procedure, and this could be good or bad, but we want to document what we're currently doing. If we have a drift that we don't want, we want to bring people back in line. Perhaps over time there's now some non-value-added activities or documentation occurring in the document that can be removed. And perhaps there's been some process improvement going on that now needs to be updated and captured. You also want to look over it with an eye for any regulatory changes. Now, the guide was recently revised and everybody needs to go back and look over their documents and make sure that all the steps in your documents are in compliance with any regulations that you fall under. You want to look over your equipment list and your materials list and ensure that those are still accurate. Uh, a common pitfall I, I've seen here is do you have a specific brand of material reference such as a particular type of glove? Is that really necessary? Is it enough to say latex gloves need to be worn in this procedure as opposed to VWR latex gloves, things like that? Is the owner listed on the document still the most appropriate person to have ownership of that document? And are there other groups using the document that need to be aware of any changes or consulted for current best practice? It's a great idea whenever you're revising a document to have both a peer review of other groups and end users using the document and also a review by somebody outside of the area who's not as familiar with the procedure, again, looking for those clear, concise words, making sure it's easy to see what steps need to be followed. Deviations. The idea of writing an SOP is to standardize the work and prevent deviations from happening, so hopefully your SOPs are helping to avoid deviations, but they can happen. It's important that you have a system to address deviations so people can report them, document them appropriately, and investigate why they happened. People should feel comfortable coming forward with a deviation to report it, so try to make your system as easy as possible and to handle deviations in a consistent manner. When you're writing your SOPs, you want to try and envision areas where deviation might occur and address those within the document. So plan with your end in mind. Again, getting back to does your procedure have a range or tolerance that's acceptable? Put that in the document with the specification so people know what the range is. And it's important to keep in mind that deviations could lead to revision of the procedure. They could result in a time or cost savings or a new way of doing things. It's important to always look for process improvements and capture those in your documents. These next two slides outline partial lists of SOPs that Taconic has in various departments, and they're a good illustration of the numbering system, the consistency in titling SOPs. So you can see these all start with a two or three letter code which defines the department or area that the SOP originated in, followed by a numbering system. And you can see some of the descriptive words used in the title, such as taking samples and isolators for microbiological monitoring, the technique for closing the port, the technique for hooking up the cylinders, how we enter water flasks, how we do husbandry in a notobiotic fashion, building the isolators, 
And at the bottom, you see a few documents with a different code that would be material handling. So the document originated in another area, but is commonly used by technicians in the notobiotic area. This, this next list is a partial list of SOPs used in the semi-rigid isolator area. And here we have a three-letter code for the department, IBS, followed by a numbering system. And again, we are dealing with SOPs for everything from when to sanitize the facility, the flow of materials, how we collect biopsy samples, then some quality assurance documents, uh, safety documents, and then at the bottom, some veterinary service documents. You can see the last document listed on this slide, identification and evaluation of pain and distress in laboratory rodents, was a good example where SOPs were consolidated. Previously, we had a separate document for mice versus rats. Those documents were combined together with separate sections for each. And lastly, I wanted to put up a slide with some reference material if you're interested in um, additional resource for help with writing SOPs. The first uh, reference is a book called The Germ-Free Animal in Biomedical Research. This is a great resource for anyone using germ-free animals. It speaks about the anatomy, specific diet requirements, how to maintain germ-free animals, and that's available online. The second, isolation technology, uh, is also available on Amazon, really talks about how to set up an isolator facility, how to maintain sterility of isolators and supplies, and also talks a good deal about improving the productivity and efficiency of working within an isolator. And then some ALAS publications, there's a book called The 50 Years of Laboratory Animal Science, which is a good uh, general resource, has a lot of great information and also a book called The Management of Laboratory Animal Care and Use Programs had a lot of great information specific to writing policies and procedures. And the internet, of course, is a great resource to, I've found in preparing for this, several free templates for SOPs that were available to download or relatively inexpensive ones if your organization doesn't already have a template in place for you to use. And that is the end of the slide, so I will turn it over to Margaret. Thank you, Sir Ellen, for this very nice and interesting presentation. So I think we are ready to start the question and answer session. And uh, we already have some questions. So I'll read up um, the first question. Can you give an example of when a deviation may be acceptable? Okay, that's a good question. Um, so a deviation might prove to be a good thing. Uh, one example that I can think of, a while ago we had a stock of needles and per our SOP, the needles would expire at a certain time and after that date we need to dispose of them. Uh, but instead of disposing of them, we performed some sterility testing on them, and we were able to determine that the needles were still usable in the process we needed them for. So we did have to write a deviation report through our system of reporting deviations to account for the fact that we did not dispose of them at the expiration date, and we had to label them all with that deviation report. But because of that, we were able to use them and have a cost savings for our lab. So. Okay, um, another question is, should the owner of the SOP always be the author? Well, it certainly makes sense for the author of the procedure to be the owner, but it doesn't always have to be so. Uh, there might be certain procedures where the subject matter expert is not the owner of the document. They might be a technician who's performing it commonly. Or in cases where the document is used by multiple groups, it's really better to have one person be the owner. So in those cases, the owner needs to understand who to seek input from and perhaps send the document to the author for them to make any changes to. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same person. Okay, another question. How often should SOPs be reviewed? That depends somewhat on the institution and also the procedure. For some documents, a one-year cycle time or perhaps a two-year cycle time is probably sufficient to have a mandatory review. 
In addition to having a mandatory review of documents, you should have a system in place that would allow for review and revision to occur at any time between those mandated reviews. Okay, um, another question is, um, do you recommend requiring annual training on all SOPs? Uh, the training on SOPs and also retraining on SOPs might be somewhat dictated depending on any regulations that your group falls under. Uh, certain SOPs that are critical to your operation, it is a good idea to perhaps have annual training just to make sure there has not been any drift and that everybody is in good understanding of what's going on. Um, other documents might have retraining triggered by the review cycle. And certainly, if your institution dictates an annual or every two-year training cycle on SOPs, if there is a revision to the document in between those cycles, uh, you would want to make sure that you have training on place every time a revision comes out. Okay, thank you. Um, there is one more question right now. But, but please, everybody, don't be hesitant. So if you have a question of any kind, please uh, please type it in. Um, the question here is, why is a consistent layout so important? Uh, consistency is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, having a template SOP that everybody follows helps take away from the variability uh, when you're writing the document. That way the author can focus on the content and not worry about how large the margins should be, how many times should I indent this, what font is appropriate. Uh, so it helps the author focus on the content of the document. And the use of the same sections per document is also a trigger to the author to not overlook any important section. For people that are using the document, they'll get used to how the documents look and feel, and having that consistency in the font, the format, the text, will help keep them from being distracted by the look of the document so they can focus on the content. And again, if the same sections are always used, it helps them know that the document is complete and following the same format as other documents they're used to seeing. Thank you, Sue Ellen. Um, so right now, there may be no more questions. If not, anybody else has a question right now, please type it in now. <laughs> Otherwise, Wait a little moment. <laughs> Otherwise, you of course can always ask questions also after the webinar when you have maybe seen the slides again from Sue Ellen. So if there are no more questions now, I would like to thank Sue Ellen for your presentation again. Very nice, very clear, as SOP should be. Um, I'd also like to thank all attendees for, for dialing in and uh, listening to our webinar. Please also have a look at our webpage for upcoming new webinars. Um, the list is growing, and um, we have a number of, of very exciting new subjects coming up. So thank you, everybody, for today, and hope to welcome you soon again. Bye-bye.